just an overview. I, I think uh, for those who are observing the market, um, of I'm sure you you will feel there's a bit of like you know like FOMO bullishness. It's as if like you know the market correction that we experience um is like already behind us, and now we are in the new new bull markets, right? So, um, some of you have seen the post by Adam Koo. I think Mister Lu also posted something to say. You see, um, I, uh. Yeah. You know, deploy money when the when the market corrected. Now I have a decent gain now, so something to show, right? So, so I think those are some of the message we, we tend to see when the market turn uh green, turn bullish. But the, the questions, right? Whether this one will become a like a new bull market or is it like we're going to see a U turn back? I think this one is yet to to know that right? nobody can predict, right? So, but if you look at the chart, you can see that okay, it's trending up now. I think the the mood has changed quite. Quite uh quite a fair bit uh, compared to end of last year. Um, that this one is um S and P five hundred. Uh, if you look at QQQ, I think it's even a lot more, right? So I think it went up by thirty percent if you compare to the period around October. Then I think the recent news uh early May Fed uh increased the rates uh by twenty five basis points. Even though there's all this uh crisis uh in the banking sector, the regional banks, right? So everyone was like. Uh, like trying to guess like, whether they will just pause earlier than expected because of all this crisis. But it seems that they they, they still hide the, the last 25 basis point. Uh, and the forward-looking expectation is that uh, we probably won't see further hikes uh, at least for the next few quarters. But but this one really depends on inflation. Uh. Later, I'll show you the, the uh, expected rate hike moving forward. So this one is just the federal fund chart of uh, federal Fed fund rates. Uh. So you can see that actually, if we just compare one year ago, right, it was like still very close to zero. And within one year, uh, the height, the short rate, right, increased by 5%, 500 basis point. This is this is very, very significant increase. Uh. But as of now, it seems that they're going to pause here and hopefully with this higher interest rate, it's able to cool down the, uh, cool down the inflation. So we are now here, 5%. And if you look at the dot plot, I think this dot plot was released uh, in March. So they don't do it every every meetings. So in one year, there's there, there are altogether eight uh, Fed meetings. Uh, this will only come up on a quarterly basis. So only four releases uh, per year. Uh, so this this was the March one. I think the next one should be around June. So you can see here, right? Um, they, they project, they, basically all, all these dots, right? Each of them is like uh, one of the governors. So they give their opinions on where's the Fed fund rate uh, by end of 2023, end of 2024, 2025, and the longer run rate now. So if you can see here, we are currently already at, at this level, at the majority level, meaning that uh, if this expectation is correct, right, that means from now until end of the year, probably we won't see a rate hike, uh, but we won't see a rate uh, cut either. So we'll probably see the, the interest rate stay at current level for some time now. So, so it's like fighting right between inflation versus um like uh versus the economy. If economy really slow down, inflation slow down, uh, I think they will they will cut also because uh once it affects the employment, right? This is something that they they have to take care of as well. Okay, so uh this one is just to show the US Treasury yield curve. Um I, I plot the blue line. This is just one year ago. The red line is the latest available one. It is it's Friday rate. So as you can see, the short rate, right? This is the rate uh, essentially controlled by uh, US, US Fed. So you can see that it already increased by 5%. But let's say if you own a bond fund, right? And the bond fund could be, you know, the duration could be five years, 10 years, or even like those TLT, right? Which is very long. Actually, the, the increase isn't that much. We're talking about like, you know, between three to 4%, not, not even 1% increase now. So it seems that uh, if you're just looking at the yield curve, right, what it implies is that most uh, market participants actually uh, anticipate that the interest rate will come down uh, in the future. That's why they are okay to buy a, a bond, let's say yielding, um, let's say 4% at three years, right? Why, 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 if, if you think that the interest rate won't reduce, right? Why would you buy this bond and yield less than just owning a 5.5% uh, short-term bonds, right? You can just buy buy the short-dated short one and keep rolling uh, every year for three years. You still get higher than the 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 4% that you get by buying a three-year bonds, right? So it's downward sloping, meaning that 
people think that okay, I better lock in while I can because uh, as the as the Fed reduce the rate, all these rate will reduce as well. So so they want to lock in. Uh. That's why you see a downward sloping. Uh. So but I, uh, this one, I think if you just look at the US rate, I think let's say if you just look at 10 year, right, close to 4%, I think this one is still okay. But if you look at Singapore rates, right, uh, as you look at like 10, 20, 30 years, right, those are really, really low. Eh? So, so I don't think it makes sense to, you know, like just um, lock in such a long dated bonds for so uh, at the yield that is so much uh, lower. Lah. So so this one is the, it's just my personal view. Lah. I, I think um, for me, if, if there's money that I don't want to invest into stock market, right, I would rather just just buying short dated bonds and keep rolling rather than lock in at, at a much uh, longer and low yielding rate now. So that's that's just my opinion. That's why I'm not not buying you know like those like long term bond fund. Uh yeah, this is the forward looking one as you can see. Um, like uh, now we are at five five percent to five point two five percent. Um, now the expectation is that they will keep this until Q three and then after that probably inflation will have like cool down and then they can slowly decrease the rate down, right? But I personally think that this one, um, this part is okay, but the the part that they pricing it, pricing in the interest rate to drop to, let's say, you know, like 3.5% by mid of next year, I, I, I'm i a bit skeptical. I, I, I think probably this one can only happen if the inflation drop. Lah. And whether inflation will drop or not is still a question mark. That, that's the things. Very hard to predict. So anyway, this is just the, I mean, the market expectations, right? So if, if you disagree and, and you, you are confident, you can bet, bet against them. Uh, I'm not going to do so. Uh, I'm just, just, I mean, taking as an input to say, okay, I, I want to know what, what is the rate expectation price, price in by the market, but it's not like I want to act on this information. So it's just, it's just for FYI purpose only. Okay, these are more like economy and macro stuff. Uh, but I'll go through a couple more uh, like information, which I think is quite useful. Okay, so mainly I will focus on US market because I myself also I, I don't invest much in local markets. So uh, the focus is still on S and P five hundred. So say for example, this one is uh, showing the revenue per share. As you can see, revenue per share right, is it's going up like almost like a straight line. Oh, oh, only those period there's a recession period, right? Those you know like the blue color bar here. So you see revenue will drop. During 2008 and 2009, revenue also dropped. During COVID, also revenue dropped. But as of now, if you just look at the data up to Q4, it's still going up, right? But we know that if you just look at Q1 numbers, I think it's slowed down a little bit now. But this one, remember, this is per share figures. So as those, uh, you know, like large cap, they have a lot of uh, free cash flow. They do share buyback, uh, the outstanding shares string, right? So it still helps with the revenue per share stuff. But this one, I I don't think we'll see uh, the kind of you know steep increase over the next one or two years. Uh, we can see that the recent data already you know is mildly positive, but it's not like going up like a like a at a very high high growth rate now. This one you can see uh clearer. So it's the same chart. It's a revenue per share. It's just that instead of showing the absolute numbers, right? It's like what what's the revenue numbers, right? This is showing the year over year change. So as the revenue increase, you, you, you should see a, um, a, a bar that's above zero. Let's say if the revenue is shrinking, you will see a period where you, you see here, 2000 and you know, like 2008 and 2009, uh, revenue actually decreased, right? And you can see that right after COVID, right? We, we see that the revenue per share, uh, it was growing at between 10 to 15%. And Q4, we already see a, a somewhat slowing down, you know, like to below 10%. And I believe for Q1 numbers, it will be even lower. Let's say maybe closer to 5%. I, I forgot what's the numbers. I don't have the data. But just uh, just uh, like a sense, right? It's like, it's like slowing down. So just, just take note on this now. Then the next one is earning per share. Of course, uh, if companies just generate revenue, it's not enough, right? They have to be profitable. So earning per share also important. Um, I mean... People say buy S and P five hundred and hold 10, 20, 30 years. I think it's all backed up by this chart, lah, Meaning that you want to bet that the earning per shares will keep on increasing. So, uh, if it increase at seven percent rate, it should follow this upper line. But even if we don't see a seven percent increase per year, at least a five percent increase per year also decent, right? Because, uh, the 
the price earning multiple don't have to increase. It just stay fixed, right? The PE stay fixed and the earnings, earning per share increased by 5%, meaning that the, the S&P 500 index also increased at 5%, right? So historically, I think it's between 5 to 7%. Uh. So um, we are, we're still seeing the increase. It's just that, that there's a little bit of turning back, turning down here. Whether it will go down a lot more, uh, that's that will happen if we, we, we are entering a recession. Uh. But as of now, uh, it's not recession yet. We haven't seen, seen uh, a clear recession uh, signals. Uh. So that's earning per share. Then the last one I want to show is the uh, valuations, uh, whether valuation is high or low. So this one is also like mixed signal, right? It, 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 I, I, let me just brief you for those who are, you know, like not familiar with this chart. The, the red line, right? This is the S&P 500 level. The blue line, right? It's like you take the 10, the multiple, let's say that you take the 10, multiply by the, I think this is talking about earnings. So you just 10x of the earnings, this will be the line. And then 12x, 14x, 16x. Then you can see where, where's the line at. Say, for example, you, you see during 2008, 2009, right? It fall to as low as 10x earning. So meaning the PE is very low. But right now we are at about 18 times earnings. 18 times earnings, you ask me whether this is high or low. I'll say this is not low. Uh, low, I would say, let's say between 10 to 14, you can say, okay, it's quite low. La. You see, during COVID period, it's quite low. Right? It reaches like, what, 12 or 14x. Um, if you go up to above 20, 20 will be definitely high. La. Now, 18 is relatively higher, but it's not like super high. It's not like bubble kind of situation. It's also not, not that low. So whether it makes sense to buy now or not, I think depends on your horizons. Uh, but just need to remember if you enter the market at like 18x earnings, right? And let's say if just drop to 14x, which is not like a huge drop, right? So you need to like do your maths, uh, like it, it, how, what's the percentage drop? Uh, it could happen, right? It's just because of the, the valuations multiple. It's, it's nothing about the uh, earning per share. If the earning per share drop, that means all this uh, blue line, right? They all drop together, right? So um then it will be worse. Nah. That will be a recession scenario. Nah. That is why, um, you know, when people look at macro, they tend to like pay a lot of attention to recession because usually it's during recession. You, you see all this blue line here, they all drop because they are like the same earning per share multiplied by different uh, multiples, right? So so it, it can drop one. It's just that as of now, um, we see there's a little bit of drop, but, but it's not like recession type of, of, of picture, right? So just remember we are, you know, Oh, slightly over on the expensive side, but but not overly expensive, uh, and definitely not cheap. <laughs> For those who who compare the the price level versus let's say like you know the peak and say now uh because it has dropped by I don't know what 10, 15 percent, uh, so it is cheap. Um, they they haven't been paying attention to the valuation multiple. Uh, so I think this is take this as a one um one data point. Then there are a few more, uh, which I think quite interesting. This one I think I showed before. Uh, it's just that, uh, you know, I, I don't pay too much attention to this. It's not like I'm looking at all this chart or, uh, every week or every month, right? So it, it's, it's more like every couple of months uh, when I suddenly feel curious, then I'll look at all these indicators, uh, see whether we are, you know, valuation-wise, are we on the expensive or not? Right now, I, I feel that just looking at the market so green, right? I, I think that we are, you know, slightly more on the bullish side. Uh, but we, we need to pay with some information, like right? some chart help us to 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 know whether our feel is the correct one or not. Sometimes, sometimes the feel is is different compared to the statistics, right? So, so um, we we need to be aware of that also. Um, the first one is Buffett in indicator. I think this one is just compare the uh, market cap versus the total GDP. So again, you see this one orange line overvalued. Then the second one is just looking at the PE. I think this one is more specific. And this is the CAPE, the Schiller PE. So it's comparing against the average of past 10 years earnings. Uh, it's the infl inflation adjusted earnings. Now. So you can see again, this is at the orange uh, one standard deviations. Now. So also overvalued. Then the next one, uh, interest rate model. So this one is like comparing the interest rate versus the stock market. Uh. So let's say the interest rate is very low and stock market is very high. So what this model tells us is that, okay, it is justified. But the interest rate is higher. Uh, so you expect that the stock market should be lower, right? But if the stock market is not 
as low as what is implied by the interest rate level, then you see that this is uh, showing on the uh, on the more pricey level. So it's just a comparison. Uh. See, see uh, after you consider the interest rate level and the stock market level um, and, and compare against the his, uh, historical data, are we on the pricey side or is it on the on a uh, like a low valuation side? So again, this is a uh, value fairly valued, not 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 uh cheap, not cheap and not expensive. Then the next one, this is just looking at the trend line. You know, someone who look some people are interested to look at the the uh, S and P chart, uh, like zigzag up up up. Then they just draw a trend line, right, and see how far away from the trend line. So if it is above the zero, that means it's above the trend line. If it's below, that means it's below the trend line. And currently, we are also at the orange, so overvalued. Then lastly, the U curve model. This is the one that they look at the U curve whether it's inverted or not. Uh, because if the U curve is inverted, that means um it gets like a recession indicators, right? So um and the stock market should be lower if the U curve inverted. But if you look at the stock market today, uh, that's not the case. Uh. So if you look at this as an indicator, it shows that the market is very, very uh richly or overvalued. And I think yesterday I okay for those who haven't you know subscribed to the Substack. Um, I think I shared my Substack on on the Telegram group. Um, this is what I wrote. Basically, just just uh something just to note down what's my current view on the on the markets. Uh. so um and, and I mentioned about this point right talking about the um corporate earnings like the corporate earnings. I think uh, over the past two or three weeks, you see, I think most companies that I, I pay attention to, they beat the estimate. But I just want to say, although they beat the estimate, but the estimate is actually um, already, you know, like the low estimate. The expectation isn't high. That's why it's easier for them to beat. Uh. So, but if you forget about the expectation, just looking at their current growth rate, their current, um, let's say their margin, profitability, and so on, um, it's not like super good, right? It's definitely not as good as between 2021 and 2022. La. So that, that's my view. La. That's why I want to pull out some information just to you know like bring out the points, right? So these are the companies that I observe. So I'll go through one by one. Uh, I'm not sh like, okay, this is what, I'm, I'm just focusing on the revenue and specifically the revenue growth rate. So, uh, see whether the company is growing or not. So the first one is Microsoft. Uh, as you can see, when, uh, during 2021 and 2022, the growth rate like is like so many quarters we have been observing, right? They are growing at about like 15 to 20%. But the latest quarter, this is the one that's beat estimate, you know, but the growth rate is only like 7.1%. This is already one of the best results uh, relative to other peers, you know, but it's only like what, 7%. I would say it is decent, but of course, if you compare against, you know, like 20%, 7% is like one third of it, right? But the good thing about Microsoft is that the trend tends to be more stable uh, because they, um, you know, their mode is still very strong, uh, and you you just look at their revenue; it's like it's like very stable up. Uh. It's not like those cyclical type of uh, business. Uh. Um, next one, Google. Um, you see, two point six percent, almost not growing already. If you compare year over year, it's like flat. You see, the quarterly revenues is like flat. This one is definitely because their business is mainly on advertising. Uh, during when, when when the macro isn't that good, right? Uh, companies cut off on their advertising. Uh, so that's why you see the growth rate isn't that good. But it's better than the previous quarter. The previous quarter is really, really close to zero. But you need to remember, uh, you see, during period like 2016 to 2020, these are, I don't know, four years, right? They have been keeping at a 20% growth rate. And then during um, 2021, they are as high as 60%, but this one is comparing against uh, during COVID periods. Uh. But once they normalize, right, they are usually around 20%, but right now we are seeing like 2.6%, right? So that's why I say it's not, not that impressive, uh, the growth rate. And Apple, negative 2.5%. <laughs> so uh, not good. And if you look at their PC, uh, the uh, Mac segment, right, it's like, okay, negative. And it's not a negative 5%, 10%, right? It's like, what, negative what, 30%, right? So, so it's, it's not like good pictures. Uh. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. But anyway, in terms of their earnings, they're still earning a lot. So still have tons of cash. They can still do their buyback. And the buyback will actually support the share price, right? So that one, I think that one is good. It's just that uh, revenue-wise, um, maybe we need to see some form of breakthrough uh, or some some form of like a new product category, which they say they're going to announce some uh, VR headset, right? 
hopefully those will bring in like new revenues, but still yet to see that. Then the next one, uh, this is very similar to uh, Google. Um, Meta is like 2.6%. But this one, just looking at the revenue alone is not enough. You still need to see uh, their expenses, see whether how much they spend on their metaverse. And recently, they, they shared a bit on their, you know, their chip design, uh, their so-called investment into all this uh, generative AI uh, and, and so on. Right? So this is also quite interesting. But um, I think for Meta, because they are, they are really, you know, they make a lot of profits. It's just that if they spend too much, then you can see that the profits will drop uh, very significantly. La. So, so this one, if you just look at, at revenue, it's not enough. You need, you need to look at the margin as well. And, and by margin, I mean um, comparing how much they, they take in as a revenue versus how much they spend on all these uh, um, like new technology and capex. La. Okay, Amazon. You see, uh, again, they have been growing at, you know, 20% for so many years. And now you can see that the growth actually dropped quite a fair bit. And the most scary thing on Amazon is that even the, even the cloud business, uh, AWS, also um, in terms of their growth already dropped a fair bit in the re recent, maybe I would say two or three quarters. Uh, that's why the share price also is quite depressed, right? Um, yeah, so, so I, I would say, not good uh, for Amazon because this is always a company that is growing at you know like at least I would say 15%, but now we are at 9%, right? Still, I think this is number that beat the expectation. It's just that by just looking at the absolute figures, um, it, it isn't that impressive. Huh? But uh, uh, for Amazon, I would say revenue, if they are able to keep at, let's say, even between 5 to 10%, it's still okay, but they need to, you know, um, generate free cash flow, huh? which is a, uh, which is a big challenge for them over the past uh, few quarters because they, they expanded too much on their uh, in, in infrastructure, their logistic. Now they want to, you know, like uh, make the company more efficient. Uh. So different kind of challenges. Uh. Then NVIDIA, you see. <laughs> NVIDIA, if you look at their, um, oh, I don't have the slides here. Actually, if you look at their price over sales, right? Um, some, I think she can uh, share with me this screenshot to show um, someone posted about their price over sales. Their price over sales currently is about 28. So it's really, really high, you know. So um, that's the valuations that is really, really crazy, I would say. If you look at their price over earning, it's like close to 200. The question is always like, okay, we know that generative AI, all these things uh, is the future. But whether we will see the increase in revenue, right? Uh, it's a question mark, right? Because if we see that all this bring in a lot of revenue, then we should at least see it on TSMC revenue, right? Because if I look at TSMC revenue, isn't growing a lot. So I'm actually very skeptical, especially if we're just looking at the coming uh, earning release, like, which is next week. Like. I'm very, very skeptical whether they are able to generate a high growth rate uh, given that just last quarter, their revenue growth is negative 21%. So that's why skeptical. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not investing at NVIDIA right now. Uh. Yeah, um, to me, long-term hold is fine, but um, if you're buying at current valuations, uh, if the revenue disappoints, then I think the share price, share price will follow. Just, just, just be careful. Don't, don't think that, oh, because the current hype is AI, generative AI, all these things, then you keep on just piling money into NVIDIA. I, I would say we know that this is a great company, but still need to have, a, have an eye looking at the valuations and, and don't, 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 don't buy at any valuations. Just, just be, be careful on that. Okay, Tesla. Okay, Tesla, I think... Um, Still okay, growing at 24%. Still a lot higher compared to the rest of the big tech. But 24%, you compare against um, their historical revenue growth also like slow down a fair bit. And this one is very interesting because if you look at their uh, number of cars sold, right? Still growing at a very, very decent numbers. I think it's like around what 40%. But this number dropped so much uh, is because they, are, they cut the price. So that one, of course, it will affect their revenue growth. Uh. But 24%, I was saying, uh, it's, it's decent. It's just that relative to their valuations, uh, definitely 24% is not good enough. Uh. They, they, they need to grow at between at least 30 to 40%, right? That's, that's my expectations. Uh. 
Then, of course, uh, I think there's one question asked me about the Snowflake. That's why I, I post the Snowflake as well. So Snowflake, I think uh, during past one or two quarters, I think their growth rate is about, you know, like 100%. If a company can grow at 100%, meaning it doubles every year, you double three years, it becomes like eight times already. Double four years, becomes 16 times already. That's why the valuation can be go- can be crazy uh, as long as they can keep up at the high growth rate. But even so, you look at their uh, growth rate already slowed down a fair bit. Now it's already at 53%. I would say still decent at 53%, but I think that this number is going to drop also. Uh. So I, I don't expect they keep it keep it at you know like above 50%. It probably will go down to 40-30% in, in a couple of quarters. Um, yeah. That's all on just a couple of texts. Um, you, you see, this is just like looking at one indicator only. So if you want to make like informed decisions, one indicator definitely is not enough. Uh, of course, all these are, you know, tend to be big tech. They tend to be companies that are growing when, I mean, during like 2021 and 2022, right? So their valuations also tend to be higher because of the high growth rate. That's why I pay a lot more uh, attention to their growth rate. So say, for example, if you are looking at a company because of their, let's say, uh, value peak, right? You look at their PE, what you want to make sure is that their earnings, whether it's sustainable or not. So you pay more attention to other indicators like their earnings or free cash flow, right? So it's just just uh, like, okay, um, just one indicator is already like so much to look at. Um, but of course, uh, you have to pair with other indicators uh, like margin, profitability, cash flow, and so on. Other indica- indicators are also important. Uh. Okay. Um, yeah, just now I talked about uh, NVIDIA, right? Um, I pulled this information from TSMC website. I think uh, they are very nice. Just one click, you can download the entire their monthly revenue. Um, also quite interesting. Uh, you, you look at it this way, it's like, okay, every month you can compare versus the same month uh, in, in the previous year. And you can see that in the recent two months, right, uh, TSMC revenue already dropped. Uh, I think it, year over year drop is like what, around 15%. That's why I say if NVIDIA really, if their sales is good, right, um, I believe most of their, all these, you know, like GPU, uh, their data center chip is still like mostly manufactured by TSMC. So um, maybe a little bit on Samsung, I don't know the details, lah, but anyway, um, you, if if there's so much demand for all these data center chip, right, I believe TSMC will definitely see an increase in revenue, which isn't the case if you look at March and April, lah. it already dropped by 10 to 15%. Probably May and June also uh, is a negative number. Um, I have a couple more slides to talk about the company's one, but um, I'll stop here, see anyone want to share your opinion, um, anything that you want to share on what I just shared so far. So I've been solo talking for a while. Now <clears throat> got got some issue with my voice. Uh, from Prodigy, do you think Alphabet or Microsoft will win the AI war? What is your outlook for the future of Alphabet? What do you think Alphabet in the next 10 to 20 years? Uh, when it comes to the AI, I would say it's still very early. Uh, very hard to, to like make a guess on who will win. Um, but for us, I think the good thing is that, you know, all this AI is not like, you know, like let's say talking about Tesla, talking about their FSD, where it's harder for us to test drive their FSD, right? But for AI, uh, whether it's ChatGPT or BART or anything, we are the users, right? So you can use the product and see whether which one is your favorite. Uh, and if you like the, you know, the, the tools, right? I would say high, high, highly likely is that other people also will like the tools and, and will use them. So I, I think that should be the first thing that you should trust your uh, own judgment on which company come up with the best AI tool. Uh. So I can share that for now, uh, my favorite is still ChatGPT because I try but uh, a few times, uh, keep hallucinating, come up with like all sorts of, you know, like sentences, stuff that doesn't make sense. Uh, so I'm still a bit skeptical. Uh. Uh, I don't have a good, uh, you know, like my personal user experience. I don't have a good experience with but. That's why if you ask me to pick between Alphabet and Microsoft, uh, I will still pick Microsoft. I, I, I think you, you know, like companies like um, OpenAI, right? Where they come up with ChatGPT. Um, of course, it is not perfect when they roll out. They, they can't afford to wait and perfect it and then they roll out, right? They have to roll up something and then get the, uh, you know, like the user feedback and then keep on like inc- improve it, right? That should be the way. But um, 
also, I, I don't think that they, you know, like just having a crude idea, they already do something already. They, they still have a, quite a, how to say, significant um, advantage when it comes to the timing. Because I think before they roll out, right, they already did quite a significant test to make sure that their product is really good. Uh. So they're, they're still like, uh, I would say, a couple, let's say maybe three or six months um, uh, like runway before their competitors. So that's why I think, that's why in, in terms of user experience, it's still, still much better, right? But it's still hard to say that because um, this area is still very new. And then if you look at the, um, like all these large language model, there isn't so much mode around it because all these big companies, um, like in terms of their model, they, they all use similar approach. So I think when it comes to mode, it's really about how much data they, they have, right? And if you just um, look at the amount of data, I think Alphabet, companies like Alphabet and Meta, definitely they have more data as compared to um, Microsoft. La. So I think they, they still have an advantage there. But, you know, I, I would say pro and con. La. Very hard to guess at, at this moment, like which one will win. But I would say uh, in terms of their business model, also uh, it's very different because Microsoft-wise, mainly they're using their AI to incorporate into, let's say, uh, like Microsoft Excel, Microsoft Word, and make the product even more um, indispensable, meaning that all these companies that are using Microsoft tools, right, they, they won't go away because ima imagine that you're using Microsoft Word. It's a lot easier for another competitors that design another Word uh, software and just uh, grab a little bit of your market share. But if Microsoft Word can come up with very good, uh, like all these generative AI tools, which help to increase your productivity, the, the mode is a lot higher as compared to someone else, right? Someone else need to like, you know, they have to spend equivalent amount of um, uh, capex to come up with all these um, generative AI tools to just compete with Microsoft. So the bar will be a lot higher. So I think this one really um, depend the mode uh, on, on Microsoft. But that's how they, they, they position it. Like it's more like increase the productivity of their uh, customers. Uh, and it's very different compared to Alphabet. Uh. I think companies like Google, uh, it will be a lot different because their business model is mainly advertising. So how they use it will be different. Uh. So, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't tend to think that these two are competing with each other. Uh, I think for Alphabet, um, in terms of competition, they should look at like Meta, maybe even Twitter. So these are their competitions. Whereas for Microsoft, um, maybe, maybe they compete with Apple uh, in terms of their operating system. Uh. So, so these two are different. Uh. So, so in terms of AI war, um, I, I think hard to, hard to say as of now. Uh. But if you ju just look at the, looking at the search engine, right? I, I don't think, I don't think um, like Microsoft Bing is able to take the market share that, that soon. Uh. Some, someone is, uh, is like unmuting, right? So you want to share any opinion on this? Yeah. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the question is a bit uh, difficult to answer because there's no such thing as, uh, in, in my opinion, there's no such thing as winning the AI war unless he's actually specifically talking about like a singularity event or a, a AGI, which I don't think anyone is anywhere close to, to doing so. So, it's only a question of who will take market share from the products that they sell. And as far as I know, it can, it can go up and down and up and down and no one will know, no one will actually win the war. So it's not, it's not a way to, there's no way to correctly answer the question. There's no, it's just an opinion that comes in whose product will be better in the short term and whose product will be better long term. So product short term better, of course, Microsoft is having the lead, um, but that can turn at any any point in time. And uh, furthermore, um, if you talk about the long-term war, the AGI sort of thing, I, I feel that US might have a problem because even though their hardware and their software may be um, the best, best of class right now, they seem to want to regulate AI and they will lose to a country which does not have such qualms. So while such countries may be hampered by the lack of hardware, uh, I, I think that that is not the, the main gist. If they don't have restrictions and if they don't have moral or ethical qualms, um, they should be able to uh, to play on a better, on, on a different playing field from USA. La. So it might not be Microsoft or Google that, that, that wins it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
personally, are you still using uh, Google or have you tried Bing just because of the chat GPT or this, or this new stuff yeah, there? Yeah, of course I use chat GPT. La. I mean, I, I can tell you that is, I use it for, I ask a lot of statistical, statistical questions, uh, meaning that large, uh, large samples and it's quite disappointing. They are not able to tell me, uh, like for example, I want to say, uh, I have a lot of 1 million pieces of parts and I inspect five parts and I found that none of them are defective. What's the chance that a whole million of pieces are good parts and they're not able to answer correctly. So mm. they, they seem to have some mathematical inaccuracies mm. baked in. It's just a language model. So so it's not an AGI. It's not able to learn statistics at, at this juncture. Like maybe I'm using the prompt wrongly, but but it, it just gives me witty answers and that's about it. Yeah. yeah, this this one very interesting because I I saw there's a tweet that I explained why uh ChatGPT is so bad when it comes to uh mathematics. Uh. so I, I for example, like you you take like what 252 multiplied by 322, right? Just do a yeah. match, right? Actually, behind the scenes, right, it's not like they do the calculation for you. They are actually looking at their data, you know, their, their tr- data that used to train the model and look at are there any sentences that uh, show something multiplied by something and just recognizing the pattern right it's not like really you, you don't you don't tend to see the exact same calculations right it's, it's more like the pattern when something let's say like like something end with five multiplied by something right then you tend yeah. to see the the uh you know the result will will be something with ended with either zero or five, right? So there's a pattern by just looking at the mess. So they, they just basically uh, respond you based on the pattern that they have seen before. As, and yeah. we know that it, it, it can be wrong, right? Because if you take, let's say 625 multiplied by 13, the, the last digit is either zero or five. That's why they are able to give you zero or five because just looking at the pattern, they, they are able to give you that. But they cannot give you the right answer because they didn't perform the, the math itself and give you a definite answer. So, so yeah. you need to understand what what's the um how, how they come up with this uh, so and, and what are the applications they are good at and and bad at uh. but I believe right um actually it's not like uh the upcoming one I think that right now they can all design like all these different modules right because how hard could it be for the chat GPT or other AIs right to understand that actually yeah you are asking a mathematic questions and can I show this mathematics into a form of like you know like like Python or whatever to do an algo to calculate it and as long as they're able to you know like put this into a maths module then they are able to calculate and and uh, give you the answers already. It's just more like interpretations. Use the ChatGPT to interpret the language and then put it into calculations. Now, Right now, I, I think the, the standard one, they, they don't put it into the calculation module. That's why it's all yeah. pattern only. But it's still very useful. Right? But the one I want to ask you is whether you are using Bing or not because Bing and ChatGPT is I, different, right? Uh, well, I use both. Uh. I mean, oh. my phone, I use Bing. Okay. And my computer, I use ChatGPT. Okay. But again, it's just for like stuff like I want to write an email summarizing the summary or email. There's some guy who writes the wrong long email. Mm. Uh, I just want to know what the main points are. Mm. Then or someone writes a long long set long summary in uh in in Telegram. Mm. Uh, I don't know whether you've seen some of these long long chats. <laughs> ah yeah. Summarize it also. Yeah. I see. Yeah, very useful. That one very useful. Either help so us to expand can... or help us to summarize now, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay. Thanks, thanks. Um, okay, just now, okay, we are halfway, right? What is your outlook for the future of Alphabet? What do you think Alphabet in the next 10 to 20 years? You, you want to answer this? I, I, I'm curious, what's your answer on Alphabet? Eh? It's not going anywhere in the next 10, 20 years. Lah. It's, mm. it, it, it is, I mean, you. it's only been, what, two zero. they were listed, what, 2011? Two zero, mm, not uh, too long. Two zero, mm. Yeah, not too long ago. Um, and, why why would they go anywhere? I mean, they're they're gonna be there for at least another thirty years, I think. Yeah. yeah. So I mean they they will evolve, they will change, but they have they have no reason to disappear as mm. far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Actually, I think that yes, I, I do agree with you. Um, like the, the mode, right? Stuff that they're good at, which is yeah. talking about like all this um the user experience, talking about their advertising business. All this, right? I, I think it's like very, very strong mode. That's why I don't think they will go away. And I, I would say 
stuff that they are good at, sometimes those are not the areas that people pay too much attention. I'll give one example. So I think as of now, right, if you consume any form of video, say for example, like you go to cnbc.com, right? And then sometimes we see there's news article, sometimes video will pop up, right? And sometimes we can click the play and just play the video on CNBC website. Just name one example, right? You notice that as, actually you try different platforms, still you will go back to YouTube, right? Just the YouTube, just the video hosting alone, right? They just like, uh, they're just much better than all the other alternatives. You can compare yeah. against Twitter also, like Twitter also, they have YouTube, uh, they have their uh, video and then you can compare against uh, Meta or Facebook. IG also have video, right? So many people host their video, but none of them is as good as uh, Google when it comes to, you know, like loading time and so on. Like you can uh, play it at 1.5x speed, all these things, all these small things. Although I, I think as of now, these are not like, you know, features that people will wow, right? But actually quite a number of other platforms, they still don't have this because I think it's still not as easy to, to create a, a video platform that is as good as Google uh, or yeah. YouTube. So, so I think these are the stuff that um, they are super, super good at. And the, the ability to create uh, and create uh, and uh, sort out the, the mess that is the internet is something that Google is really good at. Yes, so, yes. So it, the, the entire issue is that there are certain industries, like for example, this this type of industry, mm. which doesn't, um, which is more aligned to creating a monopolistic sort of situation. There's mm. it's very hard to have um, many different Googles out there. Then some people use Google, some people use Google B, some people use Google C, and yeah. that 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 just doesn't work. People will just use Google, especially since there's almost no no cost to doing so. Yeah. So. So how, how does a comparator come into the picture? So if a comparator can't come into the picture, so the only question is, will people's behavior change? Will people mm. stop, stop using search as a basis of going through the internet? Or will yep. people stop using internet altogether? So uh, so the only way that I can see that Google coming off is they really become upmoded. There's a new comparator that comes in that's able to curate and sort the web better mm. than Google. Um, and Or people do not use the web anymore. I mean, yeah. that, that, that is the way. I mean, that, that would be how they'll be knocked off the perch. Lah. Mm. Yeah, I do think that, let's say, when it comes to search, right, uh, probably others, you know, like ChatGPT, they might take up a, a slice of the market shares. But it, when it comes to um, areas where we see, like, require like all this infrastructure, like like YouTube, like which is a video hosting infrastructure. I think those that require infrastructure, one, they are still very good. Even the advertising, all this bidding of uh, ads, right? This behind the scenes, all the infrastructure, the platforms, right? For them to, to bid on the ads. I think those, they are still like super, super dominant, right? So those, it's a lot harder to, to um, compete with them now because of how dominant they are. Because it's like a, it's like a, what we call the, platform right so there's a flywheel effect there because pu a publisher will always publish at at uh, google site and then um, advertiser will also use google because the user are there so so the the flywheel is still there it's still very strong now. that's why uh, it's, it's a lot check, harder will chat yeah. gpt ever solve the accuracy issue or is not meant to solve the accuracy issue mm, i i don't think it's about accuracy though. i think let's say chat gpt right as yeah. as it with its current form, I think it's harder to disrupt Google. But with all the plugins together, and if they are something like a very good good uh user interface, I think th there's chance for them to take up a sizable market share from Google. Say for example, right, right now we we have to do the research when we go travel, right. So you still need to yeah. like go to Google search and then read your stuff and okay. then and do your own booking stuff. All these steps you do it yourself. But with ChatGPT, with all the plugins. I think in a couple of years' time, there will be services to say, okay, you just say, uh, plan something for me. They will just execute on your behalf, right? So this is mm -hmm. the things that I think as of now, uh, whatever Google is offering, they don't have such thing yet. So it's a new new, um, new environment where all this software, all this AI will do things on our behalf. And this one is like, you don't know whether Google will win or not because nobody is there yet, right? So so it's like yeah. a fair, uh, like a level of, playing field for everyone uh, for all this big tech but whatever Google good at a current uh, place I think Google will be very, very dominant uh. Uh, uh, have, tech, you uh, have you used Bart? have you used I tried it a couple of times but not not my <laughs> not my favourite I, I, I haven't tried it deeply but I mean as far as I'm concerned uh, 
uh, it, it is still a long, long journey, I think. Uh. And Google has every chance in the world to to be better than GPT. La. Mm. I mean, Google probably has more resources than OpenAI. Yeah, Even though true. Microsoft has pumped in 10 billion, but Google has way more than 10 billion. La. Yeah. yeah. And they can't afford to lose. <laughs> They can't afford to lose. Yeah. yeah. But but I'll tend to see like, for example, right, when let's say before the mobile er- uh, era, right? So we are at PC era, people will see, okay, PC, who is competing with Microsoft? Who is competing with Intel, right? So Intel, uh, Microsoft, they do- they dominate um the PC. And even until today, they still dominate PC. When it comes to PC, still many people using using uh Windows, using Microsoft, using uh like Intel chip, right? Even I myself also using Intel chip. So this way is harder to, to compete. But the but people move on, right? Like how many people actually say they, they can't live without a PC, right? There are people say, actually, actually, I don't need, let's say if I can only choose between a, a personal computer versus a mobile phone, right? Definitely they will choose mobile phone, right? So it, it, it's like, okay, the old one, the, 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 the one that dominates, still dominate, but people move on to, to mobile already. And now yeah. the question is like, okay, when talk about like internet search, right? Like websites, I think Google will dominate. But after five or 10 years, maybe people should already move on to, you know, like uh, AI personal assistant. Everyone just, just you just talk to your AI, AI just help you do everything, right? You don't even need to Google, do, do, do your search query. So I think that could happen, right? But but that's, that will be, it takes, I, I would say maybe a couple of years to, to play out, right? And mm. we don't know whether Google will be will be you know at the forefront or not now. So, I w- I won't say they are. It's not like I'm not confident. It's just that it, there could be another company that we haven't heard of that actually take a lead now. That that's definitely possible. Okay. Yeah. So that's okay. And, uh, I'll follow up with the second question. See whether you want to uh chip in this one. Now. Are you bullish in the tech stock? How would you see the tech stock in the next ten to thirty years or even very long term? I mean, we cannot live without tech. So what's your comment? Well, you know my portfolio for equity. <laughs> Same la. La. <laughs> or or tech. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I mean like yeah, yeah. I mean Prodigy already says in his end part, I mean we cannot live without tech. It's it's just gonna be the way it is, I think. That's mm. my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, same lah. Same for me. Uh, my tech, my portfolio also. Aside from Berkshire and maybe like those like uh, S and P five hundred. Berkshire, Berkshire huh? if Apple, if Apple forms the largest portion. <laughs> yeah. Those, those are uh, I'll say yeah, Apple form a uh, sizable portion. Uh, it's just that other businesses, right? Say for example, their insurance. Okay, of course, insurance business they still need some form of tech to help them with their underwriting. Uh, but it's not dominant. Like, it's not tech dominant. Uh, play right, and maybe the, uh, they are they are mostly I would say infrastructure. Uh, for those that is not Apple, say for example, they are they are you know like train. Uh, all these are really infrastructure. They are energy business, right? So these are all yeah infrastructure business stuff, which which I think is a stable kind of business, but it's definitely not tech. Uh. But coming back to overall portfolio, I think um. Uh, Typical Singaporean and my portfolio are quite in a, quite similar in the sense of we have a sizable uh, allocation into companies that focus a lot more on tech. Uh. Um, could be for me, it could be like Semicon or, or like big tech. Yeah, these these are the names. Uh. Even chi- China Tech also. So all these are tech. Uh. Uh, for non-tech one, I I have um not, not I, I don't have much. Uh. So you can see that just looking at the portfolio, you can tell really, no need to go into more details. But of course, when we talk about uh, individual companies, we can we can go uh, deeper. Okay, the next one, what do you think about Snowflake? You, 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 do you look at this company? No, I don't look at this company. You don't look I, at it? Yeah. I, I still hold these companies. Uh, it's just that I think this company is a very typical uh, SaaS company, uh, software as a service. So they don't have the infrastructure layer. They only have the top layer. And I always tell people, when you compare uh, SaaS, right, which is the top layer versus like um, the infrastructure layer, the, the SaaS layer is always the, the layer that earn the most profit. Like for example, NVIDIA. NVIDIA is also more towards the, the SaaS level because they, they do the software part, right? Whereas the hardware, the manufacturing, they pass to TSMC and Samsung, right? So they that's why their gross margin can be very high. But uh, the, the thing about the SaaS level is that you really, really need to be the best because if another companies come up, they can easily replace you. Whereas if you focus more on the infrastructure layer, the infrastructure layer is a lot harder to uh, compete uh, because they require a lot of investment. 
So you, you see all the big tech that tend to uh, occupy the, the base layer, say for example, the AWS, Azure, uh, GCP, these are, you know, like the low margin, but very sticky business uh, operating at the infrastructure. But when it comes to top level, these are companies like, um, you know, like Snowflake. Uh, so so they, they can compete with uh, AWS because AWS also, they have what they call the red, what is it already? Uh, red shift, right? Or uh, Google one is BigQuery. So these are actually, it's actually um, co- uh, their competitors. Uh, but I think Snowflake is still like, in terms of the user experience, uh, user interface, I think still slightly better. Um, that's why people still use it, right? But when it comes to uh, their valuation, I think the valuation is still very high. La. So for, for me, I, I'm still invested. I, I don't plan to sell or buy more at the moment. Uh, keep a small stake and just follow on the company, see whether they, they are able to continue sustain a high growth rate. La. But in terms of their overall long-term picture, I would say still depends on whether they are able to realize their, their you know, their, their long-term super goal, which is to become a company where... Uh, where how to say uh, like like they are be- they become the middle persons of all things related to data because they, what they want to do is to uh, to make all these companies to park their data with Snowflake and it's not just storage right it's like okay since you already parked your data here with us why not you make your data available for people to subscribe to right so so they they want to become a company to to become a brokerage of data something like that the middle middle persons right so like a so, data warehouse. They they are already a data warehouse. The the software layer meaning that for example, okay. let's say let's say you have companies, right? Um, yeah. So let's say first they they want to convince you to use their software. So why not you park your data in onto their platforms, and then you can let's say if you want to do data analysis on the platform, you can use their machines. You can use all this. It's all operating on the cloud. So that's the first stage. So second stage is that they say, okay, you have this, this, this data. This could be proprietary data. Uh, are, are you interested to, you know, let people subscribe to your data? So let's say people subscribe to your data, then, then you can actually take a profit, right? You, you can rent out your data. And at the same time, you also notice that, hey, actually the data that I want, I want, right, could be some data that's available on Snowflake, let's say for free, or some data could be offered at like a fee. So you also subscribe data on the platforms. So when that happened, right, is that, you know, data doesn't need to transfer from place A to place B. The data, they are all sitting within Snowflake control. They just open a key and then you can uh, tap on other people's data and vice versa. So as you can see, more and more people on board onto Snowflake platforms, right? It become a platforms for the data flow. So that's their ultimate goal. Uh, they, they want to be such a company. But as of now, it's still early. Uh, they, they are still very early. Um, this, this one probably will take three, five, ten years uh, for them to realize this goal. And whether it will succeed or not is still a question mark. So because they still need to compete with other, other companies, right? But I think the good thing is that there's, there's still a very clear propositions for company that don't want to rely solely on one single cloud companies. Say, for, for example, you don't want to get married with uh, Amazon, right? Uh, and, and just use AWS on everything. Then I think using Snowflake, they're still, still, uh, um, they, they're still able to say, okay, you don't need to like concentrate on one provider. You can still use us and uh, we will front it for you. But back end, they still rely on all these uh, three big um, cloud companies in, in, terms, in terms of the infrastructure. Uh, so they become the middle person. Uh. So uh, I, th- I think in terms of business, it's quite interesting. Uh, just that um, valuation is still an issue. And if you look at their profitability, it's still not profitable at the moment. Uh, but the story, the narrative is still there. Whether you want to bet on it is, is another question. Uh. For me, I bet a little bit just to follow on the companies. Uh. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's on Snowflake. Next one. Do you expect a market downturn when the Fed starts to lower the interest rate? That's a strange question. <laughs> <laughs> you you want to what's your I opinion mean, on this? Usually, usually people expect the opposite, so I I'm not sure where this uh this question is coming from though. You you mean what, what do you mean by opposite? When you lower the interest rates, there'll be more liquidity in the market, right? Yes. So wouldn't that mean that the market will go up? I see. Uh, okay, I, my my take on these uh questions and my response is that. Uh, you, you are right in the sense of 
usually if you look at history, right, uh, when the interest when the Fed when the Fed cut interest rate, that's when the market crash. Uh, but that's correlations, but not causation. Causation is the other way around. Usually, it's because the market is starting to see some weakness. It's already shaky. That's why the Fed will be forced to cut rate because they see things are not good. So, but the causation is that things are not good first. That's why they cut the rate. It's not like they cut the rate and that will cause the uh, market to, to crash. You know? So, so that's, that's a little bit of like, uh, need to understand the causations there. Now. So like not, right now, right? Like the interest rate is still high. If you are Federal Reserve, you will still keep at current level unless you see something that is very, very bad coming, right? That's why they will keep it until something breaks. Uh. So that's, that's the, I would say at okay. least that's the general uh, narrative. Uh. But so whether, yeah. If banks, start, if banks starts closing down, that's when, uh, let's say, uh, there's an emergency situation, they cut the interest rates as a result, then the uh, stock market crash because the banks are closing down. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. Let's, say, let's say one or two small banks uh, collapse, right? Still not bad enough. That's why you see Federal Reserve haven't cut rate. But when they cut rate, right, you can imagine it will be a lot more serious than maybe two or three small regional banks that collapse, right? Say, for example, like Bank of America really go bankrupt now. I don't think they are able to cut the, uh, to keep the rate at like 5%, right? For sure, they have to cut like 100, 200 basis point already if you see like a big, big banks uh, collapsing, right? So, yeah. so that's why it has to be serious. Uh, and and when, when they cut rate, you want to understand like what are the serious crises that is brewing to assess whether yeah. it makes sense to enter or not. Uh, so based upon the earlier slides where you showed <laughs> that it's supposed to glide down, which mm -hmm. is lowering interest rates, yes. we don't expect it to uh, create a down market downturn uh, if it's actually what they actually focus on. Uh, they're trying to glide it down rather than cut it down. Glide it down means what? What's the difference? Glide it down means uh, cutting one percent, one hundred basis points every year, just like what you showed inside the chart. Where it went from uh, five point two five to four to three oh. over every year. That sort of that sort of reduction. This, this one. Yeah. Uh, no. The 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 one with the um, the governors all forecasting it. The one with the dots. Oh, okay. Uh, the one with the dots. So this one, yeah. I think, I, I think this one is like, uh, okay, all these, um, they are projecting the expectations. Now. So let's yeah. say if interest rate can drop to, let's say, right, interest rate drop to 1.5 or 2%, there's no reason to, to keep the yield uh, or short-term rate at, let, let's say, 4.5%, right? There, there's no point. Yeah. That's why I think they can afford to cut. Uh, but they, they will cut a little bit, a little bit. Uh, let's, say, let's say one year, right? From now, you see now it's what, May 2023, right? Until end of 2024, if they can cut to, let's say, 4%, right? That's 1% cut over 18 months period, right? So this one is a very, very mild type of cuts. Now. So, so I would say that if they really cut in a significant way, that means something really serious that's brewing and we don't know what is that. Now. So that's the, that's the thing that you want to pay attention to, which is the, the what, right? For example, like during 2020, that's the COVID situations, right? When COVID hit, even the the Fed fund rate is at zero percent doesn't mean that you want to like keep keep putting money in, right? So so that's that's the we need to like not just looking at one indicator, so we need to piece together the, the entire environment to 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 fairly assess it. Okay. Um yep. For me, just to come back to these questions, right? I'll I'll say just, just pay attention. See any? Do we see, see any further weakness uh, in the market or not? Uh? Like, like, do pay attention to the bank. Pay attention to the commercial real estate. Uh, pay attention to the inflation. Um, pay attention to the valuation of the market, and yeah, and, and make assessments. See whether you want to, you know, like change your strategy or not. Uh? For for me now, it's more like okay, still continue DCA, but slow. So it down a little bit. Uh. That's, that's my stand uh, at current moment. Okay, next one. Uh, the S&P, sorry, the SP5, I think this is talking about the largest top five companies uh, versus S&P 500 questions proposed by volatility trader is of interest. Do you think there are arguments for the 
under or over performance of such an index. Mr. Typical Singaporean, are you still there? You want to comment on this? Give a, yeah. a bit more context. I mean, yeah. it's on the fire group itself. So yeah. the volatility rate is saying that he'd rather invest in SP500 than SP500. And uh, I mean, I, I did some research. Then mm. you can see that, uh, I mean, it's a bias sample. Like 1997 to present, the overperformance is quite astounding. Like, for SP5 versus SP500. Um, we are talking about uh, if you actually put one uh one dollar in uh SP five hundred by today you get around four to five dollars. Uh, if you have put inside SP five, you got forty dollars. That's the overperformance that we're looking at. Uh, of course, nineteen ninety seven to now is by sample, and I was wondering if there's is there an intrinsic reason why SP five will outperform? Uh, my thinking is that the pros is large companies, institutional investors move money into it uh, at a at a at a stronger rate. Lah. So that's actually the reason why it overperforms. And of course, large companies have better management generally and a moot because they are already proven themselves. So they will grow. So those are the two pros why SP5 outperforms SP500 in that period of time. So I'm just wondering, is it intrinsic to, to the large companies it, or is it something that will, uh, will psychically change? Can, can I ask the SP5, how do you define it? Uh? Is it like really oh, at all time you track the largest five? Uh, so, so to, to make it very, uh, what we do, what I did, okay, it has no, there's no such thing as SP5. What I did was I took the January 1st largest five market caps uh-huh. and kick out those that, that didn't, let's say, let's say that year was GE, Microsoft, uh-huh. Walmart, whatever, five of them. The uh-huh. next year, maybe Walmart popped up, then Amazon came in. So okay. it'll be, uh, you'll be reset, equal weight. I did equal weight because it's easier to track. Okay. That, that's just about it. Just oh. every year, just just rebalance, rebalance, rebalance. Okay. Such. Okay, understood. So so you are you are actually taking at uh at every time point you you take the top January. five and then you just uh simple average uh at, at January uh, take the take yeah. the top five. And then you just uh, average yeah, out and I compare against S P five hundred. Okay, that's interesting. I, I can't comment too much on this. I haven't seen the data myself, but I I, I would say, um, these numbers the S P five is looking so good over the past call it don't know twenty thirty years right or even longer right. It's because um you know now we're talking about the all these fang fang companies right. So the top four or five companies uh you 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 will end up with let's say call it Microsoft. Uh, Google, uh, Apple, maybe even uh, Facebook. This these few big tech companies that's dri- that driving the returns, right? So that's why, of course, it will be tend to be much higher as as compared to just average five hundred. Average five hundred is really like just just taking at the top five hundred, right? It's a lot more diversified, right? So we can we can look back and explain how come why why we have such a huge uh outperformance of SP five, right? But whether this will persist or not in the future, I, I, I can't say that uh, I have a strong opinion on this. Essentially, this strategy is a bit on the momentum also. Say, for example, let's say, let's say as of currently, NVIDIA is not in there. So let's say NVIDIA really, or with all the generative AI, really they, they suddenly get into the top five and then they suddenly become the, the largest company in the world by market cap and, and keep on like driving the stock market, right? So that's why if you do a SP5, of course, you 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 will outperform if there's such companies and they're able to maintain the lead and, and they just outperform against the others. Now. So this is like a thesis of uh, the winner will keep on winning kind of situations. So SP5 will outperform. But uh, another alternative scenario is that the top five keep changing. It's like one company go up to the top and then you buy the company and then next year it come back down. Then you need to sell again. Then you keep on repeating this, right? And company just keep on, keep on uh, changing place on, on the top five, right? Then in that scenario, I think the SP5 actually will underperform S&P 500 because you, you buy SP5, meaning that you buy those that is the most exp- expensive one. So, so, so it, it really depends on whether winners keep winning or is it like they keep rotate, uh? If you see uh past 10 years, I, I I'll say the top five one is really winners keep winning. Because you see Microsoft, all these they are there since 10 years ago and they're still there, right? I, I same for Apple as well. So that's why you, you see a huge outperformance. Uh. You really need, need something like a winners take all kind of situation 
uh, then most of the value accrued to the top companies, then the SP5 will win. Otherwise, SP5 will not win. So that's my take. Like, I, can, I, can, I can describe like, like these two, what are the difference? But I cannot say I have a strong opinion which one will win. For me, S&P 500 is already like you are picking the large cap already. So it's good enough already. I, I won't, you know, the other alternative is, is that you, you say, I don't want to even buy like S&P 500. I want to buy those like, you know, Russell 2000, buy the small cap. And I think the small cap will squeeze into the, the S&P 500, right? So these are the mean reversion cam. Yeah. So it's, so it's like, it's a bit like a value or, or mean reversion versus momentum kind of uh, bet. If you think SP5 will win, you, you are betting on the momentum of the top companies. Yeah, yeah um, you can go to the fire group. You are, in, mm. you are inside, right? And you can see the... I'm inside, but I haven't there. been following that much. Right? It's yeah. like a few hundred messages per, per, per day. It's really crazy. I, I, Too much for yeah, me. You, you, can, you can check my, my data. Yeah. yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Okay, Um. next one. Do you have a marker for closing a position for each of your counters? What is the analysis you use? Uh, okay, this is a simple one. For me, I don't really have. A, so um, for me, I, I tend to like, even if they are expensive, I, I will take NVIDIA as an example. Even their, the, the valuation become high, I, I don't, I'm not that eager to sell out, you know? So to me, it's like a hole. If it increase too much, then uh, I just buy those that is relatively cheap. Uh. So because uh, for me, it's not like I... Imagine if I started up NVIDIA with 50% 50, 50 allocations, then suddenly they run out by 200%, right? Now become like 80 of 80% 80, 80 kind of allocations, right? Of course, I'll be worried, right? So I will say, okay, in, in that scenario, I'm not comfortable with 80%. Can I just sell out a little bit to like, let's say pay it down to 50%? I, I may do so, right? But that's, you started out with a very concentrated positions. But for me, my, my position hasn't been that concentrated. Uh, let's say it started out from 10%, even 300% out become 30%. It's not like a very big position for me. So so I'm okay to to like just hold it on. Uh, so so I don't I don't uh, close the positions um or, or have uh, any marker. Uh, but I will pay attention to the fundamentals. So if there's any things that I think will affect the long-term trajectory or I'm I don't want to bet on it, uh, I don't really care about the share price. I will just sell uh, if it is not a long-term hold. Uh. So that, that's my approach. Uh. I pay. I I will keep on asking myself like, okay, uh, long term wise, fundamental wise, is this company that I still want to like bet on, like just continue to hold on it. It's either a yes or no, right? Depending on the business, it isn't so much about well, uh, given the price, what would, what would I do, right? So I pay more attention to the business rather than the price now. So that's my approach. That's why I. I Long term, right? Long term hold. <laughs> Unless it's really like something wrong with their long term fundamentals, la, then then I have to sell, la, even at a loss. If not, it will be a DCA. Not sure if that's a satisfactory response. I mean, I need fair value, right? I, and I, when I buy a company, I have a fair value amount, the market cap that I expect. Yep. If it runs up to, to way above the fair value in a very short period of time, mm. uh, then then my thesis doesn't work already, right? I mean, I if my thesis agree. is this company is worth one trillion, mm. and I buy it when it's five hundred billion, mm. then the next the next year, and my one trillion is like oh five years from now. Yep. And next year it becomes nine hundred billion. Yep. Still below my one trillion, I would be. Who can say that? Hey, is the bird in the hand worth two in the bush? That, that's just my thinking, lah. Yep. And th this happened with Nvidia. Yep. Right? I, I, I mean, NVIDIA is a long-term poll, but hey, it's now worth $700 billion. You buy it at $400 billion market cap. You expect yeah. it to be a $1 trillion company. Uh, should you or should you not consider uh, carrying down your position, selling? What, what, what's the, the thing? I mean, yeah. should you do it for all your stocks? Yep. I do agree. I do think that, let's say, if um if you have position and you look at the valuation, you think that it's much higher than your your assessment of the intrinsic value and you want to like sell a portion, sell half or sell all, right? I, I do think that it makes sense. Yeah, either, either like, like it doesn't matter if you want to sell, I, I do think that it makes sense because you, you have one eye on the valuations, right? It's not like, it, 
I I will agree with the with the actions. It's just that I personally don't do that. Lah. That's my 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 personal way of investment. Mm. And the reason is because right in the past, right, I also like okay, think of like okay, for every companies I do a intrinsic value calculations. So I have a number, right? And and then I compare. So I only buy, let's say, if it gets like 30% cheaper than the intrinsic value. And once it go to, to let's say, like 1.5x of the intrinsic value, I need to cash out and, and flow to other companies, right? I did that in the past. It's just that I also had the experience where um, you sell at 1.5x, then suddenly it go to 2x, then suddenly the fundamental increased by two, by like two times within, let's say, one or two years, right? Then, then it suddenly become a, uh, uh, have fairly value even though the price already ran up so and, and do I want to buy back at a higher level so I will always have this kind of problem when when you have a range to say I, I must buy low and sell high within that range the problem is that that range right keep on moving and if you bet on the right companies the range actually move up with fairly fast one uh, I, I think Tesla is one good example so because if you look at Tesla uh, go back to just like 2019 right you look at how much is the revenue and you say, okay, this company, I will assign a, a price over sales um, uh, ratio that I think makes sense, right? But just after two or three years, suddenly they, are, they grow at lot like 50% per year for two years now down to 25%, right? Still much higher compared to like just two or three years back, right? So the question is that, okay, if you sell out uh, too early and the fundamental increase a lot within short period of time, right? It's very hard for you to buy back at a, price that is lower than the price that you sold at. So, so you become like a market timing already, getting in and out uh, already. So that's something that I try to avoid. Uh, I would say if their price really went above the intrinsic value, I would just um, just, just hold. I, I'm not going to buy, but it doesn't mean that I need to sell my, my own positions. Uh. So, so I try to resist that just because of laziness, uh, I would say. I, do, I don't want to like keep, all, keep paying to, attention to the price. And oh, I sell now because it's like 20x, uh, 28 times uh, sales for NVIDIA. Because the moment I sold, right, I need to watch the price uh, on and off to see, to draw a line, to say once it's dropped to this line, I need to buy back already. You know, do this kind of like, almost like a trading type of activity, which I try to avoid. Uh. That's why I rather just, uh, yeah, just, just hold on. Uh. Uh, maybe if I have cash, I can save some cash. If you drop to that level, then I, I continue to buy. If not, I'll just hold on. So that, that's my, my um, approach. Uh. And another thing is that for all these like high growth names, right? You can call it like Nvidia, Palantir or whatever. They are, the range, right? The interest value, right? The range is very wide. I, I tried to do a valuation on companies like C, companies like Nvidia. The range is like 3x1. It's like I, I can come up with a lower bound of like call it $100. But at hundred dollars to me is is like within reasonable range. Three hundred also within re reasonable range, because their valuations right can be so wide. Because it's very hard for us to guesstimate what is their growth rate over the next call it, three to five years. Because they you, you look at companies like Nvidia when they grow at super high rate right they can grow at fifty percent right? So so that's why if a company can grow at fifty percent. The valuation, the, the range of price over sales, right, is also much higher, right? So that's why if you assign a low, um, like conservative estimate versus a high uh, aggressive estimate, right, the range is very, very wide. So that's why it's very, when the range is very high, that means it's like, okay, you, you, within, within a low price, it's also reasonable, slightly higher, also reasonable, you know? That's why if it is reasonable either place, so, so I would say just, it gets a hold for me now. So, again, uh, just different approach. Uh, I, I would say I, your approach when you trim, when the price is getting too high, I think it makes a lot of sense to me. It's just that whether I want to do it or not is uh, it's different questions. Uh, is, you know? For me, definitely, if a concentrated portfolio, I will do that. I'm not comfortable to hold NVIDIA if my if NVIDIA is 80% of my portfolio right now. <laughs> but given that it is like what 10% each, it's not a, not a problem, right? They can drop 50% and I'm I'm not sweating. <laughs> so that's a good part about like a more relatively more diversified portfolio. Like, like you you don't really care so much about whether they are overvalued at the moment. Okay, uh, good discussion. Uh, we will quickly go through the rest. Uh, I think most, most of them 
I don't have much opinion also. So, so let me quickly go through that. Huh? Um, Buffett said that the ending of incredible period for US economy, however, the market is forward looking and keep rising. Is he missing something or the market? I think this one, you need to understand his point. Uh. I don't remember exactly what he means by incredible period, but I think when he said incredible means that um, he's actually compared against the period when he was investing, when he was like, what, 30, 40, 50 years old, which was, which was 40, 50 years ago, you know? So during that time, right, he can look at the balance sheet and just there are so many great companies that are so cheap that it's like sure win kind of investment for him. Now. So that period is a lot more, it's a lot harder. Uh, it's like we are not in that period anymore because the market is already much more efficient back compared to those period. Because those period, right? Imagine they can buy like companies net net. You can just buy the company and liquidate and make money right away. It's essentially arbitrage, right? So you ask me whether this kind of um, companies still exist or not. I would say it, it maybe yes, but there's always some caveat behind. <laughs> so it's not as easy because in terms of you, if you have the data, you don't have an age anymore. Uh, whereas back then, right when when uh, during Buffett, when, when he was young, uh, there are companies that is that if you have the data, if you bother to dig the data, right? As long as you have the data, you have an edge, you can profit easily. But right now, you have the data, but other people also have the data. So just, just access to the data itself is not an edge anymore. It's not an edge anymore. So, so it's a lot harder. Now. And then market valuation is also not cheap. So... So I don't think he's missing something, but but what he's trying to say is that if you look at today's market versus the the kind of environment uh 30, 50 years ago, it's definitely different. That's why that's why he's drawing a, a, a distinction between the two. It's not like he is missing anything. But of course, if you ask me, like he's not into tech, right? Yes, he has some some Apple stocks there, but uh he's not that into tech. Is he missing something or not? Maybe yes, but I think. What good thing is that he's he's playing at the field that he's good at. And when it comes to tech, he's not good at. So he just avoid. I think that's fair, right? So I would rather he avoid that area than he just like go like betting on uh, like tech stock and he's don't he he doesn't really have an edge when analyzing tech stocks, right? So it'll be a lot harder for him if he forced himself into area that he's not uh, familiar with. Now. So so yeah, that's my comment on these questions. What is your approach of risk management for your stock picking portfolio? I think just now I share quite a fair bit now. So mostly just like paying attention to the fundamentals, looking at whether they are still able to sustain their mode or not. Um, pay attention to their fundamentals, their growth, their revenue, their profitability. Um, understand the situations of the sector. Um, if the fundamental deteriorate, you want to know whether it's company specific problem or is it like a sector or is it like a macro situations? All these take a bit of experience. Da. So you need to like, you know, um, piece together different type of informations and, and make an assessment on whether you want to, you know, stay with a strategy, keep DCA, or you want to like slow down the DCA a bit, or you want to like be more aggressive. I think this one, just steer along the way. La. I would say, for me, my opinions doesn't tend, my opinion tends to be more like a neutral, like, like I don't I don't go in big and go out big that, that type. La. To me, it's more like steering steering along the way. La. This one can can go deeper. It's just that it, if you have more like, uh, more spe spe specific questions, right? Maybe you can list, list down, then we can talk a bit more. La. So I think this one good questions. It's just that for now, um, let's keep it short. Uh, plan to end the session soon. Do you think Nuvia Phoenix will disrupt the cloud server business? Um, I don't recall what is this there. So, and I haven't done any research on this. Maybe why not you share your uh, research, right? I think if you can do like um, short sharing in the Telegram group, I think this will be interesting. And I'm sure others may pay attention to the business as well. Uh, for me personally, I, I haven't. So I don't do comment too much. Uh. But anyway, thanks thanks for the questions. Next one. Huge companies have plans to break apart. 
GE, J&J, Dell, IBM, Baba. Does Amazon, Google, Meta, and Microsoft splitting would benefit business and investor? Um, I think the answer is no. Um, because all these companies, right, they tend to benefit from like flywheel effect. And all these are platforms, right? When you operate as a platform, you will prefer all these different business all operate as one because there will be some synergy uh, between, right? Say, for example, like Google, uh, the YouTube can help with the search engine because they track your uh, name, right? So all this can can help them with a more targeted uh, advertising. Same for Meta. Uh, Microsoft-wise, um, it's even more obvious they do all this bundling. So if you use Microsoft, they do bundling, they offer you something that's easier. Even when it comes to sales, right? It comes to uh, convince company to use the product. Just the bundling itself is like very, very powerful. Um, imagine now, now you, you just want to design a, a tools, let's say some similar to Slack, right? Uh, like the instant messaging for companies to use, right? Uh, even if your UI UX is better than Slack, better than Microsoft Teams, uh, good luck to you if, if you want to sell to companies, right? It's very, very hard. Whereas for Microsoft, they just say, okay, as long as you use Microsoft 365, we we give you uh, all these Microsoft Teams for free. It's already like in there already because companies don't have to do a separate procurement uh, to, to, to pay you. They just pay Microsoft, just check up the fee a little bit, then uh, the due diligence is all done already. So so it's a lot harder, uh, harder for, for companies where they operate on an individual basis. Uh. Whereas for all these big companies, right? They already have your data, they have your account, they have your credit card, they have your, you know, um, already have some contract. Um, it's a lot easier for them to roll out another service to you. So I would say they definitely just to stay as a company, a single company is a lot easier for them. Uh. So that's why whenever all these like uh, FTC or whatever, they say they want to break up all these company, they will try their best to to argue that it doesn't make sense for them to break up. I think, yeah, there's there's quite a number of examples like they're doing a lot uh, to, to avoid the situation where um, they, they have to break down. Uh. So that's this big tech. For Alibaba, I know they are, you know, like splitting. That one, I can't comment too much. I don't know uh, how much influence or, from the state, right, when it comes to decision to break up their business. So that one, I don't, do, don't want to comment uh. But I would say at least for the companies that I'm investing, I, I think they're, they still stay in tech. Uh. Say in tech, uh, meaning they stay as a single companies. Okay, I'll stop here. See anyone you want to have any last, um, you know, sharing or typical Singaporean. Thanks, thanks a lot for your uh, input today. Help, us, help, help me a lot. <laughs> if, if not solo, it's a bit tough. Uh, if not, I'll close the session. Any last sharing? Okay, no, thank you so much for joining. Um, for those who are watching on YouTube, thanks a lot uh, if you watch until the end. It's long video every time now. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Enjoy your lunch. Bye-bye.